Amen. While you're standing, I'd like for you, please, to turn with me into the book of Revelation, the 11th chapter. For those of you who may have just joined us, we have been for quite some time, for a couple of months now, several months actually, in the midst of a lengthy, detailed Bible prophecy series entitled The Signs of the Times and of the End of the Age. We know that there are many signs and we know that something's going on. Some people would describe it as the end of the world. It's not the end of the world, I'll tell you that for sure. Now there will be one day the end of the world according to Revelation chapters 20 and 21. But in the meantime, what's going on uh, are some of the signs that the end is very, very near. And it's not to make us afraid, but that we should have the fear of God and be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'd like to do, as I have done probably every month and a half or two months or so, is to give you a rundown on some of the things that we've covered. An awful lot of people know that there is what the Bible refers to or as what we sometimes call the rapture of the church. And then there is going to be, seven years after that, the actual, literal second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we refer to it as the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot of people have known and maybe have forgotten or have never really understood what is the actual calendar of events or the timeline of things to take place. I'm going to give you an idea of what God's plan is for the ages. And I told you last week that I was going to do this. And for a number of years I have designed a chart and we've made it available to people. This is the way that it looks when you see it hanging on your wall or maybe on your bulletin board. And you will actually see the title at the very top, God's plan for the ages from eternity past in his dealings with man to eternity to come. We say this because God always was and he always will be. It's easier for us to fathom how he will be forever. But for us in our finite minds to think that he has always been, he's never had a beginning, uh, then we say from eternity past. Initially looking at this, chart in the form of a banner, we see seven circles which here are representative of seven dispensations of time. When we say seven dispensations, we're talking about seven specific periods of God's dealing with man. They each have a title. And before we even begin with the first one called the dispensation of innocence, we have a reference to God who is eternal and He is the Alpha and at the end you will notice the word Omega which are the first and last Greek letters of the alphabet, the, the Greek alphabet. And in every case we have the scriptural references for this. I want you to pay real close attention to it. But again we see the eternal God who exists as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Again, He always was. There was a time in God's wisdom that he designed a plan to create mankind so that he would have fellowship with those that he would create. And so he began with Adam and Eve. This period of time is also known as the age of innocence, according to Genesis, the first chapter. The Bible tells us that the earth was perfect in every way. This was, of course, before the fall. And then, of course, there was a time when, according to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, an angel by the name of Lucifer decided he wanted to rebel against God in the spirit of pride. And he basically said, I am greater than God. And God had no alternative but to discipline him and to cast him as a form of punishment down to this earth. And therefore you see the illustrations here where he was cast to this earth. And you'll see this in every dispensation where Satan himself, known as the prince of the power of the air, according to Ephesians chapter 2, and he is uh, in the midst of planet earth. He's in the midst of mankind, tempting and deceiving. He's got a number of demons. How many? Nobody knows. The Bible never really tells us. What the Bible tells us is that one third of the heavenly host came with him and rebelled. So it's commonly believed that they are the demonic forces that are doing whatever the devil himself instigates them to do, to hurt mankind, to cause havoc, and to despise God in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But again, we see there is Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind because they had a choice when the devil tempted them to rebel against what God said. What the devil said to them is the same thing that he and his demon spirits try to say today. God really doesn't love you. I mean, if God loves people, then why are all of these happening, even to innocent people and good people? 
And basically the devil tempted Adam and Eve and said, God does not want you to be like he is. Go ahead and take a bite of this forbidden fruit. And they did so, and Adam was right there with her. By the way, as we go into the second dispensation of time known as the dispensation of conscience, according to Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the seventh chapter, it existed for the period of 1,656 years, the Bible tells us. We don't know how long the age of innocence was, but we do know that the second one, known as the age of conscience, existed for that period of time. But you'll notice here that these are the key names in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning with Adam and Eve. And then, of course, we know that Cain had killed his brother Abel, but one of the sons was by the name of Seth. He, too, is in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what this is. Go on to the next one, if you will, please. I don't want to forget this, but down at the bottom, you see what appears to be four segments, four lines, four areas uh, of what takes place when someone dies. Of course, the body goes to the grave, the Old Testament cemetery. But we see that there is the grave where the body goes. But you see, we're created to be a living soul with a, with a human spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ into your life, His Holy Spirit comes into your life. But here we see that there is the place of the ancient departed saints of God, the Old Testament place called paradise, according to Luke chapter 16, verse 22. For an example, when someone like Moses or Noah or Abraham, those who loved God and looked forward to his plan of redemption, this is in, indeed where they were at, the place of the ancient departed saints. But then at the bottom, you'll see here in white letters over uh, the black color there, the various names for the place of torment. For an example, there is hell. Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, these are various names for that place of torment. There is also uh, uh, the place of the wicked in the unseen world. But between those two areas, the place of the ancient departed saints and the place where people go when they reject God's plan of, of salvation, there is a great chasm that has been fixed according to the NIV. The Bible in the King James Version of the Bible refers to it as the great gulf fix between the two. Luke chapter 16 is a wonderful story. The third dispensation of time, as we see here, is called human governance. When God called Noah to build an ark because judgment was going to come. Don't forget these names, Noah, Shem, and his other sons as well. But we see that his sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And of course, uh, there was the flood that took place. I don't have to tell you the story about it. You learned this in Sunday school. But then after the flood, it didn't take too much longer when there was a rebellion against God. Now, God had already told Noah to... Uh, replenish and repopulate the face of the whole earth. A group of people under the leadership of one like Nimrod said, nah, we're going to do what we want to do. We're going to build ourselves a city and a tower. A tower that's going to reach into the heavens. That was already contrary to the plan of God. Are you with me in God's timeline of events? So we see it didn't take long for the rebellion to take place. So then sometime after that, God called a man by the name of Abram, whose name eventually was changed to Abraham, so that he would begin a brand new nation called the Israelite nation. The Jewish people, the Hebrews, various names there. The key names here is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of course, Judah uh, was one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was eventually changed to Israel. I, I, I'm sharing this with you so that you will have an idea of what is actually happening according to God's word. It would be great if we had just one, two, three, or four pages that told us all of these things. But we would never study the entirety of God's word. But when you study the entirety of God's word, you see how it all falls into place. So that fourth dispensation of time is also known as the age or the dispensation of promise when God gave a promise and you see the number of years that took place right there. The fifth one is called the dispensation of the law when God called Moses during a time when the Israelites had been in captivity for a period of about 400 years when God and they were in Egyptian bondage. I want you to remember that name, Egypt and Egyptian bondage. To lead the people of God out of Egyptian bondage uh, to the promised land, to the land where they exist even right now. And so again we see Moses and under there we see various names uh, during this period of time. But the law was really a foreshadowing of things to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. We no longer live under the law, although the law was there for a purpose and a reason. We are under the age of God's grace. We'll talk about that in a moment's time, but that's the fifth dispensation of time. Why do I say that there are seven? Because the Bible tells us they are. And there are seven dispensations of times. That's the, the number of perfection in God's number. Go on to the next one, if you will, please. And we see the sixth dispensation of time known as the age of God's grace. The church age. But prior to that, or what initiated that and what started that, 
is the coming of the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through the miraculous virgin birth, through the virgin Mary, through Mary who was a virgin at the time. But nevertheless, when Jesus was born, it was through the miraculous virgin birth in a small town called Bethlehem. And that's what this represents prior to the age of grace because he initiated this. He lived and he taught us how to, how to, how to live and he taught us even how to die and how to love and to obey God. Then we see the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. How about a hand clap of thanksgiving for him? And then, of course, three, after three days and three nights, he rose from the dead and he ascended to be at the right hand of God the Father to prepare a place for us, for his saints, John chapter 14. But you notice that what was known as the, uh, uh, the, para the place of paradise for the ancient departed saints, then only after Jesus resurrected, because he had to be the first to resurrect, only then could there be a resurrection of those who, uh, who died and their souls could go on to be with Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why if somebody who loves God dies today, their body may go into the ground, into a cemetery or, or a cremation, but their soul goes on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ to rejoice with Him forever and ever and ever. So we see that they are taken to the Heavenly Father, to heaven, to be with Jesus Christ. And that's uh, for this period of time. Now, when's it going to end? Only God the Father knows. But during this age and period of God's grace, the church age, we see that the devil is still a liar and the father of lies, reaping havoc and causing people to fall or at least trying to. But the Bible says we've got to look to Jesus Christ and keep uh, uh, our eyes on Him. This seven squares representing a church are the representations of the seven churches of Revelation. There actually existed seven churches in a place called Asia Minor in the book of Revelation. The second and the third chapter talks about that. But they not only represent those actual churches that existed, and there's the names of those churches right there, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, and what they represent. But uh, there have been seven periods of church history since that time. And uh, there have also been seven types of churches that have ever existed. Just like you see Ephesus uh, and Smyrna. And we see Laodicea which uh, signifies the lukewarm church. But Philadelphia signifies the loyal church again. Some of this may be hard for you to see. But I want you to know where we're at in God's timeline of events. But there have been seven types of churches in existence since that time. But you want to know something else? In any given Christian church, there are seven types of Christians in any church. There are the lukewarm, but there are also the loyal and so on and so forth. But again, we see that Jesus himself uh, has always been in charge by his spirit. And then in 1948, right here towards the end of this dispensation of time, Israel becomes a nation once again after over 2,000 years of being dispersed all over the world. The diaspora, it's called, it was called. Nobody ever knew that it would happen, but it happened miraculously. In other words, even some people said it will never happen again. And then, of course, there was the regathering of the Jews. That, too, is a sign of the times. But here's what's going to happen. And, by the way, there still is this place of uh, torment, the place of torment, the place of the wicked. There still is a place called hell. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't want to go to hell. Give your life to Jesus Christ today, okay? i, I got to encourage you with that. But there is a place of torment and it's called hell. But the, at the end of this age, whenever God the Father said so, there's going to be the rapture of the church when we're going to be taken up to be with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. But before the seventh dispensation of time starts, there's going to be seven years of great tribulation on the face of this earth like this earth has ever seen nor shall see after that. That's exactly the way that the Bible describes it. And then we're going to be rejoicing with Jesus Christ in heaven. But during that time, there are going to be many great tribulation judgments taking place. The tribulation judgments, seven seals, seven trumpet judgments, seven bowls. Uh, we taught on the book of Revelation a few years back, and it took us a few years to cover it because there's just so much. I encourage you to read the book of Revelation. If you ever get to the point of saying, man, I just can't understand it or I'm afraid of this, just ask God to show you what, what you can learn from this. So there we have that between the sixth and the seventh dispensation. Go on to the next one, if you will, please. Then we see the actual literal second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ according to Revelation chapter 19. And it's right there. The second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. Now in the rapture, seven years prior to this, He will not set foot on the earth. We're going to be caught up to be with Him in the air, in the clouds, and be with Him forever and ever and ever. But He's going to come back the second time. And the Bible says we're coming back with Him. He's going to initiate the battle of Armageddon whereby He will destroy every repudiator, every enemy, anyone who doesn't want anything to do with God and their 
there are an awful lot of people like that. And it's called the Battle of Armageddon in a valley called Megiddo. When Grace and I and Amaris and a few others were in Israel a number of years ago, they took us to see this great, great valley where more battles have been fought right there in that valley than any other one spot on the face of this earth. But that's going to be the final battle, the Battle of Armageddon. But we see here uh, that there's the seventh dispensation of time known as the Millennial Kingdom. 1,000 years of Christ's reign on earth. When He comes back on the second coming, the Bible says He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. It's hard for you to see this, but this artist rendition of Jesus Christ coming back again on the Mount of Olives, you can't see it right now, but there is a split in that, val- in that mountain where He's going to make a valley where there was no valley. How many of you know that to be biblical truth? The Bible tells us that in the same way that He went up to be with God to be... To be with God the Father, He's coming back again. He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. He's going to march right down through the Kidron Valley into the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem, which has been sealed right now for thousands of years. And He's going to reign in His temple. uh, And He's going to rule the entire earth from the city of Jerusalem. How about a hand clap of praise for that? Did you know that Jerusalem, according to God's design, has always been the capital for the Israelite people, for the nation of Israel? It's always been the capital. There was an awful lot of people and governments and nations that didn't want to recognize Israel as a nation. And uh, so uh, they said, no, no, let's, let's keep the cattle in Tel Aviv, the capital in Tel Aviv. Thank God that they said, no, Jerusalem is our capital. Now thank God that the president one day, not too long ago, says, you know what? Let's just acknowledge what God has said all along. Let's just move our, our embassy to Jerusalem and, and we're going to be a part of recognizing Jerusalem as the eternal capital, the holy city for the Jewish people. And that's what happened. A lot of people did not like that, but that was a part of God's plan as well. Give the Lord a hand clap of thanksgiving if you don't mind. So he's going to rule for a thousand years. The earth will be restored to perfection, perhaps in the same way that it was before the fall of mankind. Christ will reign on earth from His throne in Jerusalem. The saints of God will reign with Christ for a thousand years. And yet He will always be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. During that period of time, beginning at the beginning of that, the battle of Armageddon, Satan will be bound and thrown into the abyss. There's that little picture right there. The abyss for a thousand years. But at the, at the end of that, it says, After a thousand years, Satan will be released for a short time to battle against God and will then be judged uh, at the great white throne judgment that you see right there and then cast into the eternal lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever and ever. I told you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, this is a good time to get saved, give your life to Him before it's too late. Tomorrow is not promised to you and it's not promised to no man. It's not promised to anyone. But you see, there's going to be this judgment. Did you see this where those who will have died prior to that time and have gone to hell as far as their soul, their spirit is concerned, they too will have a resurrection after the millennium to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says all of the books were open. In other words, they will be opened according to Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Why will they stand before God? So that they will see that their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. You're not going to be there if you're saved. This is so that those who reject Jesus Christ will stand to see that their names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. Why? Not because they were bad, but because they rejected the plan of God for their lives. Heavy stuff, right? So again, there is the great white throne judgment right there in our artist's rendition of that. And then, of course, uh, that's when God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And the old heaven and the old earth will be done away with. Remember I said Ome- Alpha and Omega? There it is right there, a representation that God lives forever. He will bring forth a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God Himself. And the Bible speaks about the river of water of life as clear as crystal. And so that gives you and I an idea. Go on to the last one. I think there's one more which just shows you the last two dispensations of time put together. So again, there's number seven. God's number, it's the number of perfection. I want to show you an outline illustration of the book of Revelation. Easy to understand. It doesn't have to be hard. Go ahead and put the next one on if you will, please. And it's all based on one verse of Scripture which introduces all of the other chapters and verses of God's Word. The Bible says in Revelation 1 and verse 19, Right therefore, Jesus tells John the Apostle for you and I. He says, Right therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. Revelation 1, 19. The book of Revelation is broken down into three parts or three segments. The first one refers to the things that you have seen in the eyes of John 
Uh, the apostle, he saw, he was there at the death, burial, uh, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was being crucified, he was there when Jesus said, Behold thy mother. And he said that to John. So there's John's vision of the glorified Christ. The second part of the three parts of the book of Revelation are the things which you are, the things which are, that right now, according to chapters 2 and 3, you remember the seven churches of Revelation, uh, and the condition of God's people, and that's what that does. And then, of course, there's the third and final part of this three-part breakdown, and this is the longest. It's called the things which shall be hereafter, according to that one verse of Scripture. And John himself is caught up into the very presence of God so that he would see the accurate vision that Jesus Christ had given unto him. But that, too, is a representation of the rapture of the church and the saints that will be caught up to be with Jesus Christ. Those are in, Reve in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, particularly in chapter 4, the Lamb takes His throne. And then within this third segment called the things which shall be hereafter, we also have the great tribulation of seven years, all the way from chapter 6 to the 19th chapter. We see that there's something going on with the first half of the tribulation period from chapter 6 to 9. There's something in the middle of the tribulation period, chapters 10 to 14, and then a, an awful lot of awful, awful, cataclysmic, catastrophic things take place towards the end of the great tribulation period. We may be able to talk about those things today. But then at the end of that, we see that Jesus Christ is coming back in the second coming. Chapter 19 is all about that. It, does this make it a little bit easier for you to, to study these things? Amen. And uh, then there's going to be the millennial kingdom of Christ, Revelation chapter 20. And then the new heavens and the new earth, chapters 21 and 22. Okay, So there's that. The outline of the book of Revelation. Um, and I, I, just, I just want to encourage people. Now... The sixth chapter of the book of Revelation begins to describe some judgments that you don't want to be a part of. Nobody wants to be a part of that which takes place. I told you last week or the week before, I can't remember what it is, a lot of people are spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. Now he may very well be alive on planet earth preparing for his appearance on the scene of this world. But he's not going to be revealed until after the rapture of the church. So why spend a lot of time trying to figure it out? People will take the numbers of uh, the names and try to figure out who is 666. But the Bible simply says he will not be revealed. Are you greater than God if you're trying to do that? No, none of us are. But we should be aware of what's going to happen. But he's going to initiate uh, an awful lot of havoc upon the face of this earth and the lives of people. I would like to give you an overall outline of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that some of you have heard about. Books have been written about it. Songs have been written about it. Movies even have been made. This is just the first page of this. There's one, two, three, and four. Again, an overall outline of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. you got to understand that they represent very real types of judgment to come. There are four different riders on various colors of horses. The first one is called the rider on the white horse. And that signifies the introduction of the Antichrist uh, and, the, and the proposed peaceful intentions of the Antichrist but are nevertheless false. This is in the first two chapters of Revelation, first two verses of Revelation chapter 6. Well, let me just mention something else by the way. Revelation chapter 6 and the first two verses of Scripture speak about the first of the seven seals of Revelation introducing the rider, this first one, on the white horse who comes on the scene with a bow in his hand but no arrow. Now I've never talked about this as of yet but I believe that it bears mentioning. He has a bow in his hand, you'll see that right after this, but no arrow. Why? Because it portrays one who will at first conquer by peace but his deceptive actions will escalate into an all-out war. In biblical terms, he will be one bent on conquest, which means that he will have an insatiable lust and a desire. There it is right there, a bow but no arrow. He will have a lust and a drive for conquest. Then there's the second rider on, the fi on a fiery red horse. The King James says a bright red horse. And this stands for war and the end of peace as we've known it. You think that there's a lack of peace right now? Guess what it's going to be like after the rapture of the church. This is Revelation chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. The third rider is called the rider on the black horse. And this is the picture of wartime inflation. Also economic collapse. Now listen to this very carefully. Worldwide hunger and famine. Verses 5 and 6. If there's one thing history has shown us it is this. 
Famine generally follows war. War quite often follows famine and the end result is always death. So this is the picture of desolation and warfare that leaves people without money or food. Incidentally, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 5 tells us that the rider on the, on the black horse was holding a pair of scales. Uh, the King James Version uses the term pair of balances in his hand. Why the pair of scales? I'm going to explain something to you. Remember this. First, the idea is that whatever it is to be weighed is determined either by quantity or value. Secondly, scales are the emblems of justice and equality. An awful lot is being said about equality these days. Thirdly, in this context of Bible prophecy, the pair of scales, as with the scale, uh, the sale of grain by, by weight, has become a symbol of scarcity, as in the scarcity of food. And you know, there's an instance in the Old Testament where God was warning a disobedient people what He would have to allow if they did not change their ways. Leviticus 26, 26 states, You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. It's going to get bad. Ezekiel 4, verses 7 to 11 goes as far as describing the rationing of food in a time to come. What about the fourth rider on the pale horse? Some say this is the one to be most feared above all else. Now remember, these riders represent four very real types of judgment to come after the rapture of the church. So this comes in a combination of several areas. Nuclear war, which is one of the signs of the times in and of itself. We'll be talking about that in a few weeks to come. Widespread, worldwide famine. Also, plagues on a global level and the devour of, devouring of men by the wild beasts of the earth. Now that you have a better idea of God's timeline of events, God's plan for the ages, and the book of Revelation and this here, let me give you very briefly the 30 basic signs of the times and of the end of the age based on Matthew chapter 24. The first few verses of scripture describe the disciples asking Jesus, when will all of this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age in those exact words? So let's just go through this very quickly so that you will know and what to look forward to. Some of the things that we've covered are false Christs and false prophets. You see, where false Christs will pretend to be a way or the way of escape. False prophets will pretend to know a way or the way of escape, but in fact, they will not. They will be deceptive. So those are the first two. The third one is called wars and rumors of wars. What a sign of the times based on Matthew 24 and verse 6, which says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen first, but then the end will come. Number four, famines like I never before. Not only a famine of food, but the Bible speaks in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, a famine of God's word where people will no longer have an interest in the word of God and there will be a famine of the word of God. It says the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord. You don't have to turn to it, but I'm going to quote this. When I shall send a famine through the land, God says, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, when I ask you to memorize a scripture or to remember where it's at, man, I'll tell you what, I, I want you so badly to do your best to try to remember where that's at. Don't just pass it on. This is not just a quiz that your pastor wants to put you on the spot with. I want you to know where these key verses of scriptures are so that you will know when the time comes how to overcome. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not playing games. The devil's not playing games and God's not playing games. You know, I ask you, remember passage of Scripture, and I challenge you, and I say, what is, what's that one verse of Scripture? Very few. There are some. I know who you are. You know what that Scripture means, and you know where it's at. I challenge everybody to get back into the Word of God. The number one prayer yesterday at the National Mall was, God, let us return back to you and to your Word as we repent of our sins. <laughs> the devil's not playing games, and neither should we. Famine, unlike ever before. Get back into the Word of God. There's an awful lot of people that go to church and they never really open their Bible until it's time to go to church. Lord, help us all. If I can't preach that, then I am, I'm not worth my salt as a pastor if I can't say that. Do you understand what we're talking about? We're dealing with eternal matters. So again, number five, earthquakes in various places. We talked about that. Number six, plagues and pestilences on a global level. 
Number seven, unusual activity in the sky, including the UFO phenomena. Some things are really happening out there, but I'll tell you what, all or most of it, if it's not just a deceptive thing, an awful lot of demonic activity is going on because, again, the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. So, number eight, strange weather activity unlike ever before. Number nine, as a sign of the times, are you awake? Backsliding and the age of apostasy. We're seeing this now more than ever before. Do you understand why it's important to summarize these things every once in a while? Number 10, an increase of wickedness in perilous times. What the Bible describes is exactly what's happening in some of our main streets in the city of, in, in the United States of America. And a lot of people are describing it as like a war zone. And they're saying things like, I would expect this in different parts of the world where there's war, but this is in our own cities. Seattle, Portland, St. Louis, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, and the list goes on and on and on. There are some reporters who are very liberal who say, oh, most of it is peaceful protesters with, burnings, with buildings burning in the background. What a deception. Buildings actually, and I showed that to you. I showed that to you. Buildings burning in the background as well as people lighting cup cars and, and vehicles on fire. Oh, this is mostly a peaceful protest. Nothing wrong with a peaceful protest if that's what it is, but there's an awful lot of people that just want to do damage. All right, so we're talking about all of these things that we need to be aware of. Uh, an increase of weakness in perilous times. Disobedient to parents and to authority. We had a chance to talk about why people despise authority, including law enforcement, more than ever before. Because God, in Romans chapter 13, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, tells us <clears throat> that God Himself established the authorities for a purpose and a reason. Number 12, people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Church? No, I got a game going on. That kind of thing. That's just the, for starters. Forgive me if I sound intense about this. I want people to know Jesus Christ and to put the priorities in the right order. I got my sporting activity, my recreation. Nothing wrong with that in its right place. People will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Thirteen, a sign of the times. An increase of spiritual coldness, spiritual lukewarmness, and spiritual apathy. The lack of caring. Number fourteen, the gospel will be preached worldwide. The last two Sundays we covered that. It's been online. People are getting blessed by this. Now, we may not be able to cover this today because this is very important. But uh, we're going to be talking about the, the invention of international television. Uh, internet and social media. There's some good things that are happening in social media, but there's an awful lot of bad stuff where people just want to complain about this or that. And I'll tell you this now in case I don't get to say it a little bit later. Don't you know that even if the, the Antichrist is around today, there is the spirit of the Antichrist, and there are people that are gathering personal information from people that are sending it all over for the world to gather it. Amen. I don't believe, I thank God for social media like we have the opportunity even to have this program, this message, this ministry on YouTube and online and so on and so forth. But there's an awful lot of people that misuse and abuse the tools that God gives us so that they can air their dirty laundry about somebody else or maybe even a spouse or a family member. And not only that, why do you got to tell the whole world you're leaving town for 10 days? Guess what? You're not the only one, and the person you're sending to isn't the only one. You may say, oh, but I only send it to a select few. The devil has ways. He's the prince of the power of the air. Why do you got to tell people that you're leaving town for 10 days? Oh, look, we're in the Bahamas. Ah, the thief says, good, they're not home. Let's go. This is an invitation. I don't know why you got to do that. Why don't you just spread the good news? I believe that's why God created and gave us these tools, right? And then also, in a few weeks, we'll be talking about the rebirth of Israel as a nation, miraculous as it was, but only God could make a way when nobody knew, but overnight it happened. 1948, May 14th. The regathering of the Jews to their homeland, even right before that time, and throughout this period of time. Number 18, as a sign of the times, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, number 19. And then number 20, as a sign of the times, of the 30 major signs of the times, scoffers in the last days mocking the message of Christ's return. I'm so glad that the children are here today so that when somebody says, ah, I don't know why you people believe in that stuff. Jesus isn't coming back again. But you'll be able to raise your Bible and say the Bible says he is. And I believe it because the same Bible that prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would come the first time, he's coming back again. Woo! You need to know. 
But don't just take my word for it. You study it for yourself. You learn those passages of Scripture. You study the Scripture. You memorize them. Come on, man. Take a stand, man. Learn the Word of God so that you'll have an answer. And then number 21, the increase of immorality. There was a time that people didn't believe in just living together because they knew that that was sin. Sin's always sin. But we're just going to have sex. We're not married, but we're going to do it because it's the free world right now. The immorality. An increase of mass deception. The increase of knowledge on the earth. Economic depression. These are all signs of the times. 21, 22, 23, and 24. And then number 25, the arrival of the nuclear age when John the apostle saw the vision that Jesus gave him about the sky rolling up like a scroll. Now we know what that means. But 100 years ago, we didn't. People did not know. And then also number 26, the preparations for a coming world dictator, which leads us to the next one, 27, uh, the Antichrist and anti-Christianity. Number 28, anti-Semitism, which is a hatred towards the Jewish people. There are nations right now that are trying their hardest to develop nuclear weapons to do, as they have said publicly, wipe them off the face of the earth. But I believe God is more powerful than anybody even try, would even try to put things together against Israel. So there's that anti-Semitism, a hatred towards the Jews. Number 29, there will be a coalition of nations aggressively attempting to destroy Israel. And then number 30, when they say peace and safety, that's a sign of the times. I thank God for the coalitions that are being done to bring forth peace between nations. I really do. That's kind of a miracle in itself. It's a sign of the times. But there's going to be a time when people will say peace and safety, especially during the first three years of the tribulation period when a lot of people will say, oh, man, this is great. This, this leader that we have, he's bringing peace. He knows all of the answers. But halfway during that tribulation period, he's going to break his covenant that he will have initiated between the Jewish people and the Arab neighbors especially. And then all hell is going to break loose, if you will allow me to use that. That's a biblical terminology. The devil and his demon cohorts are going to be released from wherever they've been so that they will cause havoc against people all over this world. Will you bow your heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we've covered an awful lot of information today. We recognize that because we've got human minds, we can't fathom everything or remember everything, but Lord, we're going to work at it. We're going to do our very best to study diligently, as your word says, to find ourselves approved unto you, O God. Work men and women who need not ever be ashamed, but we will rightly divide the word of truth. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord, today more than ever before. We need you in our hearts and in our lives. Oh, God, show us the way as we get ready to make good decisions, sound decisions. In this place with every eye closed and every head bowed, but every heart humbled, as well as those of you watching online by way of any of the devices that you can use, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, this is your moment and this is the time. Don't turn him away. You'll never straighten out first, but he wants to straighten you out first. Say this after me and mean it with all of your heart. Those of you watching on TV, Father in heaven, this is my time right now to be changed from the inside out. Come on, say it out loud. I give you my heart, my life, my mind, my past, my hurts, my confusions. Take it from me. As I give you my heart, Jesus, and my life, forgive me of my sins. Forgive us, Lord. We repent. Have mercy on us. You are the one, Jesus, who died on the cross with pain on my behalf by the shedding of your blood to wash my sins away. And you rose from the dead. So as you live in my heart, I give you my all. I am now forgiven. I am now free. I am a Christian. Not just by title, but by a relationship now. Of the saving kind. 
In Jesus' name, I am now free. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. That's a good prayer, isn't it? For those of you who are with us online, we want you to give us a call. The telephone number is right here at the bottom of your screen. And we would love to pray with you. If you don't have a Bible so that you can study the Word of God, we'll send one to you. And the same goes for anyone that is here. If you don't have a Bible and you'll study it, we'll give one to you absolutely free as a gift from our heart to you. And that's just what we want to do. If you live in the Pueblo area or if you're visiting in this area from out of town, we'd love for you to join us for a time of worship at Abundant Life Church, located at 1001 Constitution Road in the Belmont area of Pueblo. The time of our services are 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We at Abundant Life Church believe you'll find a loving group of people here and an exciting atmosphere of fellowship, hope, and encouragement. We look forward to seeing you.